Good morning, Oak Street. Welcome to our online service here this morning. We are so glad that you and your family have joined us. If you were on Facebook this morning, like we've been doing for the past couple months, go ahead and go to the bottom right side of your screen. You're going to see a button with an arrow that says share, and you can share this on your personal page, and that way we can get the message of the gospel out to as many people as possible. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us here in worship this morning. Um, A big hello from all of us here. We are waiting and hoping and praying for the day that we can all get back together, Um, but we're taking it week by week, one step at a time, praying through everything. So know that that's our heart to get back together as soon as we can uh, here at Oak Street. The first announcement I want to make for you this morning is that Lifetime is going to be at 11 a.m. as always. If you're not involved in a Lifetime class, it is such a wonderful ministry here at the church, a way to get plugged in, to go deeper, to develop good friendships. And so if you are not signed up for a class, put something in the comments here on the page. Somebody will get back with you of a way to get plugged in. And if you haven't already, contact your Lifetime teacher. Some of the classes will be up here at the church. Some of the classes will continue to be online. Uh, Make sure to contact your teacher so you know what to do this morning at 11 a.m. to get plugged in there. That's our Lifetime time ministries. That's all happening starting at 11 a.m. We have some upcoming announcements, some upcoming events that I'd like to draw your attention to uh, that we are hopeful is going to happen this summer. The first is Bible Palooza. That is going to be June 22nd through June 24th. That is going to be our truncated vacation Bible school, and we are so excited about this happening, about the possibility. Governor Abbott said that camps are a go, so we're taking him at his word. That's going to be June 22nd through June 24th, and that's going to be for those who've completed kindergarten all the way up through fifth grade. For more information, you can contact Dana in the church office about that. We also have Camp Change is coming up July 16th through the 20th. Um, at oakstreet.church, there's more information about that. You can actually register right now for that camp. And that's going to be for those who have completed third grade uh, through those who have completed sixth grade are eligible to go to that camp. Again, more information is at oakstreet.church. You can give Dana a call. We're also having a couple of retreats uh, for the students. A junior high retreat is going to be taking place June 26th through June 28th. And our high school retreat is going to be taking place July 10th through July 12th. So go ahead and mark those down on your calendar if you would. Again, the junior high retreat is June 26th through June 28th. The high school retreat is going to be July 10th through July 12th. Again, um, we are hoping and praying and waiting for the day when we can all get back together. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for bearing with us during this season. We are not done uh, with ministry here at the church. We are continuing the work of the Lord. We're continuing the work that he's called us to. And we are excited about a couple of missions opportunities that we're going to have this summer. The first is going to be this upcoming Saturday, uh, Habitat for Humanity. We're going to be working on a house here in our area. Um, that's going to be the, the address for that is 223 Willow Street. That's going to be starting at 8 a.m. If you are not yet signed up and want to be, you can either contact Loyal or Jimmy Gwynn to get plugged into that. Again, that's going to be this Saturday, May 30th. And secondly, uh, the other mission that we're going to be doing is it is Mission, where is it here in our bulletin? There it is, Mission Food Bank. That's going to be June 12th through the 13th. There is some work that needs to be done in our food bank here in town. And if you are available those dates, that's June 12th through the 13th, we would love you to come and donate your time and help just make that place um, beautiful to renovate it. Again, um, there's there's a facelift that's needed. And if you want to be involved there, uh, please contact Loyal, and he will get you all the information that you need. We're excited about doing some local missions this summer. Um, Again, we want to thank you so much for the patience and the grace that you've shown us during this season. Um, It is truly a week-by-week thing. Every week we're we're praying through it, and we're searching through it, and we're asking God for wisdom and guidance. And so thank you for bearing with us during this season. Uh, We hope that uh, you enjoy and are engaged in the worship service today. The first thing that we're going to do to kick things off is tomorrow is Memorial Day. And in honor of that, there is a video uh, featuring one of our members here, Brent Homan, uh, that we would like to show you um, just to start off in that spirit. So here, here's a video. Watch this with your family. I grew up in Iowa. I started fishing 
as soon as I was old enough to hold a rod. My earliest memory is going fishing in Minnesota. And I was probably four. So I was deployed in uh, 2004 to Baghdad, outside of the green zone. Um, our job was to protect the sector outside of the green zone. And we uh, manned the biggest checkpoint in Iraq. I went 04 to 05 and then 06 to 07. And 07 is when I got hurt, when I got hit by the IED. So getting hit by an IED was, you know, it wasn't, com it wasn't uncommon. It happened a lot. Um, it just depended on which one was gonna get you. June 10th, 2007, we were uh, sent out to go to on the, uh, to secure uh, engineers that were out filling up uh, IED potholes. You know, being infantry, um, we knew what was at stake. And we had, a lot of us, I mean, we knew when it was our time, it was our time. And we were at peace with that. It was dark night and uh, I had just got off the radio and I had a handheld GPS and I was trying to make contact with the platoon I was supposed to be replacing that was guarding the engineers at the time. So I popped up around my hatch, their sniper glass, four inch sniper glass. And uh, so, you know, I felt pretty secure just popping my head up, had my hand up because I had to hit, get GPS signal. And then the next thing I remember, I remember seeing a flash and then pain. I looked down, my thumb was hanging down off my hand. At the time, I didn't know why, I couldn't feel it, but the nerves were completely severed. Um, and four inches of my ulna bone were gone. They bandaged me up. I just remember asking about my eye. Is my eye okay? Is my eye okay? And they just kept saying there was a scratch, which there was, but that's where the shrapnel went through my cheek cavity. Uh, missed the front of my eye because I was wearing eye protection, but it severed my optic nerve. You know, it's, it's something I never thought I would have to ever experience. Fishing has always been special with me. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I'd go out with my dad. It didn't matter if we caught anything. We could sit on the lake for hours and hours, but I just enjoyed being outside. I remember the peace it brought me, um, the joy of being in God's world, and how secure I felt on the water. During my recovery, uh, I started fishing. I would cast out with my left hand, switch it into a brace that my orthopedic surgeon had actually made for me, and then I'd put my fingers like this because the only two fingers I had outside of my brace on the reel, and I would reel like this. You do more recovery outside physically, mentally. Um, it just was an uplift of my spirits whenever I would be on the water. I was excited about life. I wasn't thinking about anything about what I couldn't do. It was what I could do. I just want to inspire people and I, I don't want people to think that they can't do something because of your injuries. You can make a choice when you get hurt. Either you can feel sorry for yourself or you can not let your injuries define who you are. And that's what I chose to do. Memorial Day is about remembering the soldiers that have given the ultimate sacrifice and honoring them. And we can't forget that. We can never forget that. Hi, I'm Brent. This is Kelly. Gavin's behind me. Grace is right there. And Gabe's sitting in my lap. And we're the Homans. My wife is going to read a scripture out of John, and then I'll do the prayer. This is John chapter 15, verse 12 through 17. <laughs> my command is this, love each other and I have lo as I have loved you. A greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. 
I no longer call you your, you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. That's mom right this there on my face. Command. Love each other. Thank you, Kelly. Pray, 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 pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for uh, this day, for the people that are here. Um, this weekend is a Memorial Day weekend, and uh, <laughs> it is a special day that we uh, remember our fallen soldiers and uh, that we don't forget them. And we celebrate their life and we carry on what they have set forth by giving the ultimate sacrifice. So let's remember that today. Amen. i
Amen. Whom shall we fear? We have no reason to fear. Even though, even though it looks like we're surrounded, we don't have to worry. We serve a sovereign God.
lives and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. excited I am about this message. Lord, you know I feel like a kid in a candy store. Just the things that you've shown me and encouraged me and, and I feel like you want me to share this morning. And so God, I'm going to ask you right now what the psalmist asked. Psalms 45 where he declared my heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. And my tongue is that of a skillful writer. Lord, please use the words that are spoken this morning in this place to challenge and stir and call your people to live a life worthy of the calling we've received in Christ Jesus. Lord, be glorified. Spirit, be welcomed in this place and in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to start off uh, this morning by quoting several scriptures to you. Proverbs 21, 13 says this, Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will too cry out and not be heard. Proverbs 21, 26 says, The righteous give and spare not. Proverbs 22, 9 says, The generous man will be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. And then James 2, 16 says, If you say to someone in need, Go in peace, be warm and well fed, but you do nothing to meet their physical needs, 
what good is it? Here's the fact. Many, and I would say most people in Uganda, live in abject poverty. In fact, what you and I throw away, what we take to goodwill, what we try to pawn off on other people because we don't want it, we don't even like it anymore, they would consider luxuries. The COVID-19 virus, the pandemic, has shut down Uganda. And so people that normally would go sell bananas on the street corner or T-shirts or the man who would go work construction for $2 a day, they're, they're not allowed to do that. And we've just found out that their government has issued a decree that they'll have a shutdown for three more weeks, 21 more days. Now, Here's, here's the really good news. For $40, you and I can feed a family for these three weeks in Uganda. Think about it. What it would cost you to take your family out for just kind of a moderate price meal one time, you could feed a family in Uganda in these critical crisis times for three weeks. And so Lowell has been working with the pastors of our churches in Uganda, and they've done the math. And here's what they've come up with. For $7,000, if our church would give that $7,000, we could feed all the families that attend these four churches. Now, if we gave more than that, we could feed more families than that. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to pray and ask God how much He wants you to be a part of this. Whether you feed one family or five families or ten families or you can do much more whatever God wants you to do and we will see the fulfillment of these verses out of the book of Proverbs and we won't be like that Christian in the book of James who hears about the needs or sees the needs of others and turns a blind eye to them who gives them some little cliche saying like be warm be well fed go in peace and if I know anything about Oak Street, I know this. You all will rise to the occasion. And we will be a blessing, a mega blessing, to our brothers and sisters in Christ in Uganda. Now what I just said has probably nothing to do with the scripture and the message today. And it has everything to do with the scripture and message today. So I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 5.18. One of the most important verses in the Bible. In fact, if you were to come to me and say, Pastor Joe, I have limited mental capacity. I really think I can only memorize ten verses in the Bible. This would be one of those ten that I would give you. This would be one of those verses I say, memorize this verse and let God use this as a linchpin and as a cornerstone for your faith. Now I want to begin the message before we get into Ephesians 5, 18 and following. I want to share with you what I might consider the eight most important truths that the Lord has shown me regarding the Holy Spirit. Now there's more than that, but let's just do eight this morning. And here's the, here's the first lesson that I've learned about the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit is a person. In John 15, 26, Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, He will testify about me. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not an impersonal force of God. The Holy Spirit has thoughts and feelings and emotions and ways and a will. You might look at it like this. The Holy Spirit has everything you have except sin. He is, a, he is a person. Treat him as God, but also treat him as a person. That means treat him with respect and obey what he says. The second truth is this. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak only what he hears from me, and he will tell you. I mean, all of that talks about communication. 
I attended a revival in our community this past week in another church, and the speaker said, God spoke to me in an audible voice about a certain thing. God has never spoken to me in an audible voice. Not once in 44 years have I heard an audible voice that I said, that's God. But hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, I have heard the inner voice of the Holy Spirit speaking about everything you can imagine. And you have too if you're a follower of Christ. Number three, the Holy Spirit is released through faith. In Matthew verse, or chapter 9, verse 29, it says, According to your faith, so let it be done for you. The simplest illustration I can use to use faith is, is like a light switch. You can go into a dark room and you can stand there forever. But as soon as you turn on the light switch, you'll have light in the room. The Holy Spirit's power and wisdom and love and grace and goodness is released to you when and only when you and I exercise faith. It's like this. You've got a friend, someone that you really care about, and they're not a Christian. And you can sit in your chair and say, oh, I, I don't, I'm afraid to go witness to them. I, they might throw a beer can at me. Well, they may cuss me out. They, they may never talk to me again. They may think I'm one of those uppity holy rollers. And, and you can sit there and, and just get closed down more and more. It's when you get in your car and drive over to that person's house and knock on the door and say, hey, I'd like to visit with you a few minutes, that you'll feel the power of the Holy Spirit, the boldness of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit through your life. Truth number four, only the Holy Spirit produces life and fruit. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you are full of spirit and life. You see, the Christian life is not serving and straining and struggling and trying and, and working and trying to come up with all these things you need to do for God. The, in fact, the Bible calls those dead works. They're worthless. They're useless. This, this idea that I've got to get it done and I've got to get people saved and I've got to make this happen and I've got to manipulate and motivate things, that's, that's not the Christian life. Christianity is letting God's Spirit lead you, letting God's Spirit fill you, empower you, embolden you, and use your life. Truth number five, the Holy Spirit will make you powerful for God. One of my favorite authors is a man named Dennis Waitley. And he is in a position where he is associated with some of the most well-known, famous people in the world. I'm talking scientists and business people and athletes and movie stars and all these, these kind of people that you and I consider powerful. And in his book, Seeds of Greatness, here's what he writes. He says, the most powerful person I've ever known in my life is my grandma. She lived in a little A-frame house in San Diego, California. And I would go in the summers and stay with my grandmother, and he would talk about all the things that he learned and how powerful her influence was upon his life. Listen, you, it, it's not like you have to be loud and, and forceful and in the, in the spotlight and intimidating and strong will to be powerful. In fact, think about it this way. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you, do you think that a person who does not have those qualities in life is, is not powerful? I'm telling you, you get around a person that, that, that is that kind of person, they are absolutely powerful and influential. Number six, there is a spiritual war going on inside and outside. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, 
so that you do not do whatever you want. This war that's going on between the conservatives and the liberals. This war that's going on between people who are, who are so adamant about one side of the issue and people that are they're just as adamant on the other side of the issue and it's back and forth and throw off the gloves and, and bare knuckle fighting. That's nothing compared to the war that's going on inside of us. In 1 Peter 2.11, Peter says, Abstain from evil desires which war against your soul. These, these thoughts that, you know, it wouldn't hurt to watch a little pornography. It might spruce up my marriage. It might kind of add to. It's okay to gossip and slander and say hateful, hurtful things about them. I don't have to forgive that person. Why, they hurt me deeply. They've wounded me, and I can carry that bitterness around in my heart. All those things are, is the enemy warring against your soul. John Eldridge says in his book, War and Peace, said, my, my wife and I used to give two truths to married couples. And he said, we were leaving out one of the most important parts of marriage. And he said, now at our conferences, we say this. There is a war, there is a battle going on, a war against your marriage. You better be aware of the enemy. You better know how he attacks you. You better see the division that he's trying to cause in your marriage if you're really going to win the battle. And then truth number seven, you must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 7.51 this is Stephen talking to the religious crowd who's just about to stone him. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And that was the tipping point. I mean, when, when he said that, then the rocks started to fly. You see, you can't have a marriage with just one person. And you can't have Christianity with just one person. You have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And when I talk about resisting the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about you shaking your fist in, in God's face, telling Him to leave you alone and never talk to you and you don't want anything to do with Him. It can come in very simple ways. I, I, I just don't want to do that. I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not good at that. And we resist the Holy Spirit. And then truth number eight is this. The key to the Christian life is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You see, it doesn't matter to my car. My car, if it's got a full tank of gas or, or one gallon of gas, it'll, it'll still run the same. It'll run till I run completely out of gas. But you and I are not automobiles. We're not engines. We are human beings. And you can't live the Christian life on half a tank, on half a filling of the Spirit, a quarter filling of the Spirit, an eighth filling of the Holy Spirit. The only way you and I can truly live the Christian life is to be filled with the Spirit. And so that's the message today, filled with the Holy Spirit. And we'll start in Ephesians 5, 18 and go through verse 21. When I was in seminary, I heard and eventually was able to meet a very famous person. Her name was Bertha Smith, but everyone in Southern Baptist life called her Miss Bertha. Miss Bertha went to the mission field in China and her and the other missionaries served in Shantung, China province for years and saw no results. I mean, they just labored and labored and labored and it looked like it was all in vain. And then something happened and the missionaries got together and one said, Hey, I'm sorry, I've had bitterness against you. And another one said, You know, I've been, I've been resenting you. And they got right with God and they got right with each other. And let the Holy Spirit fill their life. And that began a cascade of revival in which tens and tens and tens of thousands of Chinese were swept into the kingdom of God. 
And after many, many, many years on the mission field, Bertha Smith's sister passed away and left her money. And when she went home from the mission field, she wrote a book entitled, How the Spirit Filled My Life. And people were so hungry to know about this, they, they bought copies and copies and more copies. And she took the rest of the money she'd inherited from her sister, and she began traveling around at the invitation of pastors and churches and speaking about the Spirit-filled life. And when you went up to Miss Bertha to talk to her, he says, oh, thank you for your book. Thank you for your service. She wouldn't even hear that. Here's what she'd do. She'd look at you and say, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And let me ask you the question this morning. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? You see, for an unsaved person, a lost person, your question is, do you know Jesus? But for a saved person, the question is, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, there's been a lot of debate and a lot of arguing and controversy over different terminology used in the Bible about the Spirit. I want to give you just some of this biblical terminology. For example, there are those who talk about being baptized in the Spirit. It's in the Scripture. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's in the Bible. Walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Spirit. Pour out the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Or full of the Spirit. And you see, there's so many who want to split theological hairs. And they want to say, well, you, you didn't say it right. You're supposed to say baptized with the Spirit, not filled with the Spirit. You're supposed to say led by the Spirit, not walk in the Spirit. My former pastor used to say this. If you're arguing about the Holy Spirit, you're not filled with with the Holy Spirit. And so I would just say, listen, give people liberty and grace. If their perspective, if their terminology, if the way they look at it is a little bit different from yours, it's, it's okay. It really is. Now let's look at the Scripture, the, the Word of God, as it relates to being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery or foolishness. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, let's talk this morning. Three truths about being filled with the Spirit. And here's truth number one. I call it the caution. What is not the will of God? Paul writes, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Now there are so many viewpoints from Christians on, on this issue of drinking alcohol. I mean, it, it goes all the way over from this, this teetotaler who, who says Jesus turned the water into grape juice all the way over to this person that says it's okay to have wine or a, or a beer with your meal and with your snack and with every day of the week that ends in day, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I heard that the way you can tell the difference between a Baptist and a Methodist is that a Methodist will talk to you in the liquor store. There's a reason they have bouncers in bars and nightclubs. It's found in Proverbs 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker and beer is a brawl, brawler and those who are intoxicated by it are not wise. Now, Ironically enough, it was, I want to show you a picture here. There's a picture of a man. This is the man we have to thank. That in most Baptist churches, when communion is served, it's grape juice and not wine. This, this is Thomas Bramwell Welch. And yes, you guessed it, Welch's grape juice. And he was a Methodist minister who became a doctor and then became a dentist. But he came up with the process of, of juice, grape juice, being palatable and, and very 
good tasting without it being fermented. He was a teetotaler, and his son was a teetotaler. Now, whether, whether you know, you, wherever you stand on this, teetotalerism, all the way to social drinking is not that bad or whatever, I think the common ground that we land on is people say drunkenness is a sin. Even those who maybe drink more than you think they should will say, well, I'll tell you this, it's a sin to get drunk. But you see, even that's kind of subjective. Do you know that a 100-pound woman could have one drink of, of whiskey or, or gin or vodka or one bottle of beer, one glass of wine, and would be over the legal limit of to be considered driving under the influence? In fact, get a load of this. In Texas, if you have a sip of any alcohol and get behind the wheel and get stopped, and they can detect any limit of alcohol in your system, you can go to jail for DUI if you're underage or if there's a child in the vehicle. So, what is this? You know, even that, people say, well, you can be a little bit drunk. Or you can be moderately drunk. Or you can be stumbling, bumbling, slobbering drunk. What is that tipping point of drunkenness? Speech? Balance your reflexes, decision making, smell like a brewery or smell like scope. Let me just say two things because we could look at this and debate this all day and it's not even really the main point of the scripture. Living under the influence will diminish your impact. If drugs or alcohol are influencing your life, it's, it's a staple, it's a part of, of, of what you do, then it will diminish your impact. Every time someone sees you with a beer in your hand, or a glass of wine, or you t post a picture on Facebook and you're at the party and you're happier than they've ever seen you, that's noticed by people. That's, that's considered in regard to your Christian faith. When my wife and I went on our honeymoon to Mexico and we were on the flight and we were talking to a couple there and, and the lady looked at her husband and said, you know, he doesn't even remember the last time we were in Mexico. He didn't even remember Cancun. He was, he was so wasted. And we talked a little bit more and we shared our faith that we were both Christ followers and boy, their tune changed. Yeah, we're Christians too. Oh yeah, we know the Lord. We love the Lord. Living under the influence will destroy your imprint. You see, everybody knows what's important. You, they, they, your values. What really matters to you. It's, it's, it's obvious to people. And if drinking, if getting buzzed, if getting tipsy, if getting hammered or just saying, I just need to relax. If that's our thing, forget about leaving a godly imprint on the lives of others. And we're not even going to discuss this idea in term of debauchery. That's a whole nother thing. But it says drunkenness leads to debauchery or a very foolish lifestyle, a very sensual and senseless lifestyle. But this verse starts off with the caution, but then it moves to the command. The rest of verse 18 says this, instead be filled with the Spirit. You see, there are things that are written in the Bible that are the will of God. For example, when the Bible says, do not murder, the Bible says, do not lie, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Honor your father and mother. Obey them in the Lord. Give to the poor. You see, these are, these are written things, and we know these to be the will of God. Here's the point I'm trying to make. In the original language of the Scripture, 
this phrase, this terminology, is what we call a present active imperative. Now, a present active indicative form of these words would be uh, a statement of continual action. But this isn't that. This is an imperative. It's a command. Do not do this or you will, if you, if you don't do this, you will be violating the Word of God. In other words, it's a, it's a command from God's Word. Now, why would God be so strong in this? Why would, why would God command us, not tell us, not suggest, but command us to be filled with? with the Spirit? Why would He be so strong, so insistent, so intentional about this? Well, I want to give you two of my answers, and here's the first one. God's Spirit enriches you. Just like alcohol impairs you. Just like alcohol influences and diminishes your capacity. Might make you mouthy. Might make you stupid. Might make you sloppy. Just like, just like alcohol has this, has this bad effect on our life, the Spirit of God has the other effect, enriching, enhancing and enriching who we are. Listen, maybe you're a loving person. I'm telling you, filled with the Spirit, you'll be more loving than ever. You may be a, a giving person, but filled with the Spirit, you'll be even more generous, even more willing to give even more excited about the possibility of sharing with others. Filled with the Spirit, your spiritual gift just comes alive. It's more powerful. Instead of having this little tinky rubber hammer, you've got this sledgehammer that's making a difference in the lives of people. Listen, it might just amaze everyone who you really are. The kind of person you really are when you're filled with the Spirit. You might be amazed at the things you do if you let God's Spirit fill your life. And God's Spirit empowers you. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12.27 says, Now you are the body of Christ. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond anything you can ask or imagine, according to his power that works in you. Have you noticed that the Red Sea is not parting very much these days? Have you noticed that there's just not a lot of people out there walking on the water? Or go to funerals and see how many people are raised back from the dead but what God is wanting to do is to be powerful in and through your life and in and through my life Acts 4 31 says after they prayed the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God boldly listen you and I are the best we can be When we are filled with the Spirit of God. And so there's the caution. Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to foolishness. There's the command. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. But then there's the conduct. The way a Christian will live their life. Filled with the Spirit. Look in verse 19. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And yes, the Holy Spirit is invisible. But there are visible and tangible evidences that you and I are filled with the Spirit. If I see someone driving down the road in a Rolls Royce, I assume they have money if I see somebody hit a baseball over 450 feet over the fence and maybe out of the park I assume they have talent if I were to take your temperature 
and it were to, it were to go up to like 104, 105, I would say, you, you've got a, a sickness. You've got an infection. You, you need to get to the doctor. And you and I could sit here and argue back and forth. Well, that, the thermometer may be off a half a degree, or we could go back and forth. But the obvious is obvious. And what the Scripture says is that there are evidences, absolute evidences, that you and I are living spirit-filled lives. Years ago, I was a seminary student, and I was, I was really struggling. And I, I don't mean I was, I was going out and committing all these terrible sins. It was just in my heart. I knew there was more, and I didn't know what that more was. And we had an evangelist who came to our church. His name was Albert Rose, and he was from Kentucky. And honestly, I can only remember one illustration of one sermon that he preached. But I'm going to tell you that man was filled with the Spirit. The way he lived and the way he acted and the way he talked and the things that he did so impacted my life. And I wanted the Spirit of God that filled his life to fill my life. And so what are, what are three evidences or what is a what does a spirit-filled christian look like here's what the bible says first of all they have joyful praise verse 19 speaking to one another with psalms hymns and songs from the spirit sing and make music in your heart to the lord no kidding last week in church i sang a special and when after that was over I was flooded with offers from all around the country. I had many offers to give me free singing lessons. The Bible does say make a joyful noise. Does your heart sing to God and for God? I led my older sister to Christ many years ago and she lived in another town and about a week later she called me and said well I, I've kind of noticed something and I don't know if it's right or wrong I said what's going on she says I can't quit singing she says I'm just I'm just singing songs those old songs those old hymns we learned in church as a kid she says I just I just can't stop singing them listen happiness may not be joy but they're pretty close. And the Christian who says, I'm not happy, but I sure am joyful. I've got to wonder about that. The first evidence that you and I are filled with the Spirit is a joyful heart and joyful praise. The second is constant gratitude. Verse 20, always giving thanks to God the, Fa the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, there's nothing better than having a thankful heart. In fact, this morning, I can improve your life 1,000%. 1,000% guaranteed. How? Become thankful. Become thankful for big things and little things and everything that happens in life. And you will be amazed how your life is transformed. Well, how do you do that? Be filled with the Spirit. Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you will be a thankful person. I remember, again, years ago, going to a Bible conference. And the speaker was well-known all over the country. And I thought, man, if I can just hear this guy preach, I, I, I'm sure I'll get it. And he came up on stage and he started his message. And for 20 minutes, he thanked people. He thanked the person that came to the airport and picked him up and drove him to the church. He thanked the person for taking him to the motel where he was staying. He thanked the man who came in and turned on the lights and turned on the air conditioning. And he went one by one by one by one thanking the people who had helped him even in very, very small ways. And then the third is consideration of others verse 21 submit to one another out of reverence for christ i confess this covid 19 thing has about made me lose my religion i told my wife the other day now i understand why liquor stores were considered essential 
I mean, it's like, it's like COVID-19. I've got one nerve left and COVID-19's on it. And I've had irritation. I mean, I mean, there's some people over here and they're, they're over here so far that they say, man, this is a conspiracy. The Trilateral Commission is trying to rule the world and that's how they're doing it. And it goes all the way over to the, the other end where people say, we're never coming out of our house again. Social distancing is going to be the rule of life for the rest of life. And everybody in between. And I'm not saying you can understand every opinion and agree with everything that's being said. But what the Apostle Paul is saying here is consider others. Be considerate of others. Show consideration to other people. It's Matthew 7, 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You see, the Holy Spirit is really into unselfishness, unselfishness, not self-centeredness. And if you've got to be right, and you've got to prove your point, and you've got to make others see what you see and think what you think, then that's a great sign that you are not filled with with the Spirit. Now, let's, let's close this morning. I, what I want to share with you is how to be filled with the Spirit. It's one thing to say, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, a, it's another thing to say, okay, how do I do this? And here's how. Number one, empty yourself. You see, if you are full of anger, and bitterness, and hatred, and sin, and lust, and greed. If you're full of that, there's no room for the Holy Spirit. It just, it just there's nowhere for the Spirit to live and, and, and land. So we have to empty ourselves. That's confession and repentance. God, I've been angry. God, I've been selfish. God, I've been greedy. God, God forgive me and get it out of me. The second thing is open yourself. God's not going to break down the door of your heart to come in. There's a very special man in our church, and my wife and I went out to his home this week. He was having a birthday. And we went out to his home and knocked on the door, and his daughter answered the door and invited us in, and we had a wonderful visit. Do you think I was, going to go, I was going to go out there and kick the door down? Do you think I was going to get a battering ram and knock it down and say, get out of my way and I'm going to visit you and you can't stop me? The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Open your heart. Open yourself. Thirdly, ask yourself. Now, I don't, I don't mean ask yourself to do it. What I mean is this. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give you, your Father give you, the Holy Spirit if you ask? You see, there's a certain uh, humility in asking. And I know many of us who say, I'll never, I'm never going to ask anybody for anything. I'm, I carry my own self and I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And, and there's a lot of pride in that. And you and I have to humble ourselves and ask the Lord to fill us with His Spirit. And then finally, yield. Yield yourself. You see, you, you can't remain unsurrendered and be filled with the Spirit. It just doesn't work that way. Robertson McKilkin wrote his great book, Life in the Spirit. And on the chapter that he wrote, Being Filled with the Spirit, he talked about a young girl who came up to him at a conference, and she said, do you remember me? And he said, yes, I remember you from a year ago. You were struggling. You didn't feel like you were making any difference and making an impact at your school, and you were pretty defeated and disappointed. And we went and sat down, and we talked. And she said, yeah, and you took a piece of paper and you wrote no on one side of the paper and Lord on the other side of the paper. And then you tore the paper in half 
and you said, which is it going to be? No. No, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I want. No, Lord, I don't feel like doing that. No, Lord, I'm, I'm not up for that. Or is it going to be, you are the Lord of my life. And I surrender and I submit and I yield my life to you. And she says, do you remember when I took the piece of paper that said, Lord, and I submitted my life completely to the Lordship of Christ? And she said, I just want to tell you, I went back to my school and I made such a difference. God used me this past year in such a, a, a mighty, a, a wonderful way to touch my classmates with the gospel of Christ. And you see, that's what God wants to do in our life. And you and I, we can either say, nope, no, Lord, no, thank you. Not now, not ready, not willing, not able. And stay right where we are. Or we can take the piece of paper that says, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I say yes to you in every area of my life. Fill me, use me as you please. Let's pray. I'm asking our praise team to come up here and lead us in worship. Don't you love that? Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. I would ask you this question. First of all, do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? That you would say, I have a remembered moment in my life where I repented of my sins and I put my faith in Christ to save me. And I gave my life to Him. If you've never done that, I invite you right now. Please, please, in your heart of hearts, say, Lord, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive my sin and come into my heart. As best as I know how, I give my life to you. But if you're here and you know that you're saved, the question is, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, I, I kind of, well, not, you know, I'm well. That's not answering the question if the answer is yes you know it's yes if the answer is I'm not sure or no then the Bible says empty yourself of sin open yourself to God ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and then submit and yield and surrender to Him day by day by day by day and God will use your life. I want to pray. And our worship team will lead us. It doesn't matter where you are. In your, in your home. In a motel. Staying with friends. It doesn't matter. This can be a life changing moment for you. Lord, I ask and pray in the name of Jesus that you would, by your Spirit, get a hold of our lives. Lord, save the lost and fill the saved with your Spirit. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
First of all, we just want to thank you for joining us today, whether it's uh, via the internet or the radio. We're just thankful that you made a choice to join us. We encourage you, if there's any decision that you made that we can help you uh, walk with Christ, either as a new believer or as a Christian who wants to live the Spirit-filled life, please contact us at Oak Street, and we'll do what we can, can to help you. Well, you know, life is full of bittersweet, good news, bad news uh, things, and so I want to share some really great news and then some, some kind of tough news with you. Uh, first of all, Brandy Menard is going to be our new Open Door Christian School Administrator. And Brandy is a great lady. She, she loves God. She's passionate. She's energetic. She's visionary. And our church voted unanimously, and she accepted the call to come on as our open board school administrator. The other side of that is we have three longtime teachers who are retiring from Open Door. 
First of all, Cindy Blackwell, who's been teaching for 22 years, is retiring. And Cindy Wood, who's also been teaching 22 years, is retiring. And then Mr. Geis, who taught at our school and then became the administrator, is retiring. And so we want to say to these three teachers, thank you for your service. Thank you for investing your life and your time and your heart and your, your goodness and your knowledge into our children. And we want to also pray for them, that God would bless them as they continue their journey. They're just, they're just going to work in another part of the vineyard, and they're going to keep serving and following the Lord. So uh, please keep them in your prayers and ask God to richly bless them and to give us new teachers for the Open Door faculty that'll be, that'll be as good as the ones who have chosen to retire. And then, uh, just let me remind you, following around 11 o'clock is your lifetime group. And you can go on the internet or, or do Zoom or some of our classes are meeting with social distancing rules and, and those kind of things. But find out and please attend, attend a uh, lifetime group. It will be life-changing for you. Thank you and God bless you.